All right, class, welcome back to uh, chapter seven on muscles. This is the muscular system. Uh, there's three types of muscles throughout your body, whether it's your skeletal muscles, your cardiac muscles, or your smooth muscles. Uh, your skeletal muscles are the ones attached to bones. You guys control these. Cardiac muscles are located in the heart, and smooth muscles are located in the wall of hollow organs. Uh, cardiac and smooth muscles are involuntary involuntarily controlled. That means um, they will continue contracting. Your heart will keep beating without you telling it to. The striated and non-striated uh, refer to the appearance of stripes in these different types of muscles, and I'll show you what I mean by that. Uh, the muscular system functions. It functions to help move your parts of your body, maintain posture, breathe, respiration, produce body heat, uh, communication, because the nervous system is directly in contact with your muscles. Um, it regulates your heartbeat and also the contraction of organs and vessels. So constricting your blood vessels or dilating them um, refers to that. Also your organs, it'll constrict and contract um, the small intestines so that your food goes through your digestive tract. Properties of muscles, they have the ability to contract and that means uh, they're able to shorten. And when they shorten, they contract. And that shortening of the muscle fibers will pull up the part of the body they're trying to move, whether that's an organ, they're squeezing something, they're contracting to squeeze the heart, um, or getting smaller to um, do like a bicep curl. So that's what contract contractility means. Excitability means they're able to respond to a stimulus. So that means you have nerves that are directly attached to muscles and they are excitable. Extensibility, they can be stretched beyond the normal resting length and still be able to contract. And elasticity, uh, they have the ability to then recoil to its original resting length after it has been stretched out. Uh, so skeletal muscle, this is striated muscle. Um, it con constitutes about 40% of your body weight. So these are all of your muscles when, that you think of. Uh, skeletal muscle is so named because many of the muscles are attached to the bones in your skeletal system. Some are attached to the skin or connective tissue sheaths, especially the muscles in your face that control facial expressions. They are directly attached to your skin. Uh, so this type of muscle is striated because it has transverse bands or striations that can be seen under a microscope. Individual skeletal muscles like your biceps are complete organs and they are comprised of several tissues. They are comprised of muscle, nerve, and connective tissue. So we call the biceps brachii, brachii its own complete organ. Uh, each skeletal muscle is surrounded by connective tissue called the epimysium. Uh, the word epi or the prefix epi means above or outside. And this myo or my um, kind of two lettered phrase in this word um, or two letters in this word, whenever you see the word myo, that always has to do with muscle. A skeletal muscle will then be subdivided into groups of muscle cells that we call fascicles and each fascicle is surrounded by its own connective tissue covering called a perimesium. And then skeletal muscle fibers make up fascicles and they're surrounded by their own connective tissue covering called the endomesium. And the prefix endo means inside or within. And I think I will show you a picture of this in a couple slides about these connective tissue coverings and how um, muscles are broken down into their individual parts. A muscle fiber, um, so in your skeletal muscles or any muscle, muscle fiber is equal to muscle cell. So a muscle fiber means a muscle cell. It has several nuclei located on its periphery if it's a skeletal muscle. Muscle fibers range in length from one centimeter to 30 centimeters. Um, skeletal muscle fibers contain several nuclei that are located along the periphery or outside. And the sarcolemma refers to the cell membrane of that muscle fiber. And it has many tube-like inward folds called transverse tubules or T-tubules. Uh, T-tubules, these are these inverse or they're transverse folds. They kind of um, 
go into the muscle fiber itself. So they'll extend deep into the center of the muscle fiber. They're associated with enlarged portions of smooth endoplasmic reticulum. That's called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Um, so the sarcoplasmic reticulum will be where calcium is stored, and we'll see that in a minute. The enlarged portions of the end of the sarcoplasmic reticulum are called terminal cisternae. And when we put the T tubules and we connect them with the sarcolemma to the terminal cisternae, we call that a muscle triad. And eventually I'll show you a picture of this. Uh, so the sarcoplasmic reticulum, this is important because it holds all your calcium ions. So if you take anything from today, remember that calcium ions are stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And calcium will be important for playing a role in muscle contraction. Uh, the cytoplasm of a muscle fiber is called the sarcoplasm, which contains many bundles of protein filaments. And those protein filaments um, are called myofibrils. And myofibrils consists of myofilaments. So you, again, we see this prefix myo with everything because we're dealing with muscle. And the two myofilaments that you should be really familiar with with um, muscle tissue are actin and myosin. So here's a look at the structure of skeletal muscle. Here's a look at a whole muscle attached to a bone with a tendon. Tendons attach muscle to bones. The epimecium surrounds the whole muscle. And within that whole muscle, it's divided into bundles called fascicles. So here's a fascicle that has been pulled out. And fascicles are made up of muscle fibers. The fascicles, it's not labeled, but fascicles are um, covered with perimecium, and the muscle fibers are surrounded by endomecium. If we take the structures out of a muscle fiber, we get a myofibril, and within the myofibril, we get these teeny tiny myofilaments, and those myofilaments, again, are actin and myosin. The actin myofilament is the thin, myofilament and the myosin is the thick myofilament and you can see here how everything is um, put together within the muscle fiber itself so you can see where this triad word comes in the terminal cisternae are the enlarged ends of the sarcoplasmic reticulum which you can kind of see in yellow here so this is where calcium would be stored um, the what else the transverse tubule is kind of goes between the sarcoplasmic reticulum you see capillaries surrounding the muscle fiber um, which will provide oxygen which is important for muscle contraction you'll also see my mitochondria you'll see a lot of mitochondria in skeletal muscle because mitochondria create the atp which skeletal muscle fibers um, need to contract the sarcomere then is the basic structural and functional unit of skeletal muscle because it's the smallest portion of a skeletal muscle capable of contracting. So a sarcomere is just a unit of contracting skeletal muscle. Uh, Z discs form a network of protein fibers that serve as an anchor for actin myofilaments and separate one sarcomere from the next. So we often say that a sarcomere is bound by the border uh, from one Z-disc to the next Z-disc. I don't like, I'm so sorry, there's just a lot of words and then there's one picture at the end. Um, inside the sarcomere, that's where our actin and myosin myofilaments are. And the actin and myosin are kind of overlapping. If you would fold your hands together, that's how the actin and myosin overlap. And that gives the skeletal muscle its striated appearance and the ability to contract because actin and myosin will slide past each other, uh, causing the sarcomere to shorten. And we'll look at how there's two light staining bands separated by a dark staining band, and this gives it the striated appearance. Uh, the light bands consist of actin, and these are called I bands. The dark staining bands are called A bands, and they extend, extend the length of the myosin myofilament. And again, the actin and myosin myofilaments are overlapping, 
um, on both ends of the A band and this overlap causes contraction. And let's just show you before we go any further in kind of what I'm talking about here. So these are, you can kind of see the striate, striated appearance of skeletal muscle here. Um, and this is where my cursor is a great view of what it's describing. So a sarcomere is the boundary of one Z disc, which makes up this kind of zigzag blue shaped line. One Z disc to the next Z disc is one sarcomere. And within a sarcomere, you have the thin actin myofilaments and the thicker green myosin myofilaments. And you can see how they're overlapping. And when the actins slide towards each other and the sarcomere shortens, that is the contracting of skeletal muscle that we're talking about. Uh, this picture shows in the labels all the I band, A band, the M line goes right down the middle of the myosin myofilaments. And this is kind of a zoomed in version of what an actin myofilament looks like and a myosin myofilament. The myosin is made up of these, I call them golf club like structures because there's a rod to it and a head and it looks like golf clubs. The head part of these myosin filaments will reach up and join um, the actin myofilaments. And the actin myofilaments are made up of these two kind of um, double helical bead like structures in purple. And then there's a protein called tropomyosin, which looks like spaghetti that's winding around it. And there's another protein called troponin in red. And um, I'm gonna describe muscle contraction for you while you're looking at this picture, and then we'll go through it in detail more. But calcium is required to bind to the troponin. And when calcium binds to troponin, it moves the tropomyosin, the blue spaghetti protein, off of these attachment sites, which are little tiny and yellow. And those attachment sites will be where the heads of the myosin reach up and connect to the actin. And when the myosin connects to the actin, that forms what we call a cross bridge. And that will um, cause the muscle fiber to shorten and contract when everything slides past each other. So here's more about the sarcomere describes what I just talked about, what they're each made up of. Actin is made, or the actin are made up of actin, troponin, and tropomyosin. The troponin molecules have binding sites for calcium, and the tropomyosin filaments block the myosin myofilament binding sites on the actin. The myosin myofilaments resemble bundles of tiny golf clubs, and the myosin heads have binding sites for ATP, for ATPase, which is an enzyme, and also attachment spots for actin. And that is that picture again. Okay, so how do we get your muscle fibers to be excitable or respond to a nerve stimulus? Uh, we have to first talk about the electrical charge across the cell membrane of a muscle cell. And we call this electrical charge across a resting muscle cell, the resting membrane potential. Um, think about it has the potential to contract, but it's resting. So we call it the resting membrane potential. But there is an electrical charge that exists. Um, muscle cells and fibers can perform action potentials. And when we talk about performing an action potential, that means they have the ability to pass an electrical charge or a stimulus through their muscle cell. The resting membrane potential is due to the inside of the membrane being more negatively charged in comparison to the outside. And in action potentials will be due to the membrane having gated channels. So an action potential will occur when different ions enter that muscle and change the resting membrane potential. So it kind of shoots an electrical charge through it. The resting membrane potential exists because the concentration of potassium, and this is the K, there are more potassium ions higher on the inside of the cell membrane, and the concentration of sodium, which is Na, is more concentrated on the outside. There are also many negatively charged molecules, proteins, that are inside the cell that are too large, so that gives it a more negative inside. The presence of what we call leak protein channels in the membrane, um, they will be more permeable to potassium 
um, than to sodium. So potassium will tend to leak out of the cell more than sodium leaks into the cell. Uh, sodium, the Na, will tend to diffuse into the cell and potassium tends to diffuse out of the cell. And in order to maintain the resting membrane potential, the sodium potassium pump will recreate the sodium potassium ion gradient by pumping sodium out of the cell and potassium into the cell. That's a lot of information on that slide. Pretty much what we're talking about here is when a muscle, when an electrical charge goes through a muscle, sodium will diffuse into the cell and to to potassium will diffuse out of it. But in order to maintain a resting membrane potential where it's more negative on the inside, we have an active transport pump called the sodium potassium pump. And that helps to recreate the sodium potassium gradient, meaning the sodium potassium pump will be constantly working to make more sodium outside the cell and more potassium inside the cell. So here's a look at resting membrane potential. These are showing um, in pink, the sodium channels, and in purple, the potassium channels, which is K. This is also showing how at resting, there's more sodium on the exterior of the cell, and at resting, there's more potassium on the interior of the cell. And it's showing that during an electrical impulse, potassium will diffuse out of the cell, so that the arrow goes out and sodium diffuses in. So then an action potential. And again, we need an action potential to initiate a muscle contraction. To initiate a muscle contraction, the resting membrane potential must be changed to an action potential. And this occurs when a nerve impulse will trigger sodium channels to open and sodium will rush into the cell. We call it rushing down its concentration gradient because remember there's more sodium outside the cell. And when the nerve muscle is stimulated, it'll open up these sodium channels and sodium will rush into the cell going down its concentration gradient because it will travel from an area of high concentration to low concentration. The entry of sodium causes the inside of the cell membrane to become more positive than when the cell is at resting. And this increase in positive charge inside the cell is called depolarization. If the inside of the cell gets positive enough to, to trigger a value called threshold, we'll get an action potential. And an action potential is just a rapid change in electrical charge across the cell membrane and an action potential means the muscle cell has been trigger, triggered and a response will occur and the muscle will contract. Depolarization during the action potential is when the inside of the cell becomes more positively charged. Near the end of depolarization, the positive charge causes your sodium channels to close and now your potassium channels to open. When the potassium channels open, this starts repolarization where potassium will leave the cell. And I know there's a lot of information here, um, so I'm just gonna keep talking it through. And again, I'm recording this lecture, so you can always review this again on your own or ask me questions. Um, repolarization is due to potassium exiting from the cell. And when potassium ions, which are positive, um, the outward diffusion of potassium will return the cell to its normal resting membrane potential and the action potential will then end. In a muscle fiber, an action potential results in muscle contraction. So the first step again is depolarization where this is just a change in charge where sodium channels open and the inside of the cell will become more positive because sodium brings its positively charged ions to the inside of the cell. So this is called depolarization. Then we get an action potential and we get to repolarization where the sodium channels close. Now potassium channels will open and potassium will diffuse out of the cell and this will change back to resting potential. So this is, would be after the action potential and contraction has occurred. 
So this takes you through those steps of resting membrane potential, depolarization and repolarization, um, showing what ion channels are open and which way the ions will flow. So the nerve supply. Um, the nerve supply refers to the fact that all of your skeletal muscle fibers are connected to a motor neuron and the motor neuron will stimulate muscle cells. Where the motor neuron is connected to the muscle fiber is called the neuromuscular junction, and it's a synapse or a place where the fiber of the nerve will connect with the muscle fiber. The synapse just refers to the cell-to-cell -cell junction between the nerve cell and either another nerve cell or the effector cell called a muscle or gland. A motor unit is a group of muscle fibers that a motor neuron stimulates. The presynaptic terminal is the end of the nerve cell um, on the axon fiber, and the synaptic cleft is a name for the space between the presynaptic terminal and the postsynaptic membrane. The postsynaptic membrane is the muscle fiber membrane of the sarcolemma, and the synaptic vesicle is just a carrying kind of bag um, in the presynaptic terminal that will restore and release the neurotransmitter chemicals. A neurotransmitter are the chemicals that will stimulate or inhibit any cell on the postsynaptic side. And acetylcholine will always be the name of the neurotransmitter used to stimulate skeletal muscle contraction. So here's a look at the neuromuscular junction. The neuromuscular junction, again, is made up of this axon branch and then its branches. So this is the nerve and then the axon branches and where it connects to the individual muscle fiber. Here's a zoomed in look of each presynaptic terminal of that axon. So it kind of gets enlarged. Within it are synaptic vessel, vesicles, which hold acetylcholine, the neurotransmitter. These synaptic vesicles, when the nerve is stimulated, will release acetylcholine across the synaptic cleft, which is the space between the nerve and the muscle. And this is the postsynaptic membrane of the sarcolemma or that muscle cell. And here's a look of a histology microscope look of where the axon branch um, will reach out and touch the skeletal muscle fiber. So that's the neuromuscular junction. Here's the function of the neuromuscular junction. I just kind of spoke through these slides. Um, an action potential will arrive at the presynaptic terminal, causing calcium channels to open. Calcium ions will enter the presynaptic terminal and initiate the release of a neurotransmitter, acetylcholine, from the synaptic vesicles. Acetylcholine will diffuse across the synaptic cleft. It will bind to receptors. Um, and when it binds to those receptors, it will cause sodium to enter the muscle cell. And remember when sodium enters the mus muscle cell, that causes depolarization, which will be the first start in an action potential. So again, simply put, this is how we are forming an action potential or getting our muscle to be stimulated by a nerve. So muscle contraction and action potential will travel down the motor neuron to the presynaptic terminal, causes the calcium channels to open. Calcium will cause the, those vesicles to release acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft. Acetylcholine will bind to receptor sites on sodium channels. Sodium channels will open, sodium rushes in to the postsynaptic terminal, and that's called depolarization. Sodium will then cause the sarcolemma, which is just the plasma membrane of that muscle cell, and the T-tubules to increase the permeability of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and this will release calcium. When calcium is released from your sarcoplasmic reticulum, it binds to troponin, and troponin will be attached to actin. The calcium specifically binds to the troponin and that causes tropomyosin, which were those spaghetti-like structures to move, exposing attachment sites for myosin. 
The myosin heads will then bind to the actin. ATP will be released from the myosin heads and the heads will bend toward the center. So at this point, the myosin heads are bound to actin. When ATP is released, they'll cause um, the actin and myosin to slide past each other and the bending force will slide the actin over the myosin. Acetylcholine or esterase is an enzyme that will break down excess acetylcholine, um, causing the sodium channels to close and causing the muscle contraction to stop. Okay, so those 10 steps, I know there's a lot of information in this and everyone's kind of quiet, um, but I, any questions so far? You might have to do some studying on your own for this one or rewatch this lecture. Um, I'm just gonna keep going. You're either really lost or hopefully you're with me so far. So number one. We're here. You're here, thanks. Okay, somebody's there, <laughs> thanks. So here is the action potential, again, traveling down the neuron. And again, we're talking about exciting a muscle so that it can contract and move apart of your body, whether that's an organ, the heart, or your bones. So an action potential travels down a neuron and it eventually will release acetylcholine and it'll bind to sodium channels. And I think it'll travel along an axon membrane to a neuromuscular junction. The calcium channels open, calcium enters the presynaptic terminal, acetylcholine is released from presynaptic vesicles. Acetylcholine travels through the synaptic cleft, stimulates your sodium channels to open. Sodium will diffuse into the muscle fibers, initiating an action potential that travels along the sarcolemma and T tubule membranes. So here, this is showing the action potential jumping and then down the T tubule membranes. Remember the T tubule goes into the center of the muscle fiber. The T tubule caused the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium. And again, calcium is what we need to bind to troponin. Calcium here is binding to that red troponin protein. And when it binds to that red troponin protein, it causes the tropomyosin, which is the long spaghetti-like structure, to uncover these myosin head binding sites on actin. Then ATP molecules are broken down to ADP and an extra phosphate group, which will release the energy needed to move the myosin head. And when that myosin head bends, it slides the actin past the myosin. So here is showing the heads of the myosin myofilament bending, causing the actin to slide past the myosin as long as calcium is present, the cycle will continue to repeat. So keep sliding the myosin and shortening that sarcomere and contracting it. So ATP and muscle contractions. Um, energy for muscle contractions is supplied by ATP. It will be, energy will be released when ATP is broken down. ATP is stored in myosin heads. So ATP helps form the cross bridge between myosin and actin. New ATP will also be required to release the cross bridge. So we need more ATP to actually release the myosin from binding to the actin. And rigor mortis occurs when a person dies and no more energy or ATP is available to release the cross bridge. So within a couple hours of death, uh, rigor mortis refers to the stiffening of the skeletal muscle muscles, and that means that there's no e ATP available to release the myosin from the actin, and that causes a stiffening of those muscle fibers. So this takes you through the ATP breakdown and the cross bridge movement um, that we just talked about. Um, so here's showing the exposure of the active site. So the cross bridge calcium binds to troponin and tropomyosin move, exposing the active sites on the actin filaments. The cross bridge forms, that means the connection forms. The power stroke refers to the bending of the myosin head and sliding the myosin past it. Another ATP molecule will bind to release the myosin head 
and we get back into this cycle. And again, the, and the new ATP molecule is required to release the head from the actin. And when ATP isn't present in death, because at death your cells aren't creating any more ATP, it, release, it will not be able to release and your muscles will stay contracted or stay stiff. And that's what rigor mortis means. Um, it means cell stiffening or muscle stiffening. I got a question, Professor. Yeah, I figured so, you would at this point. <laughs> Great. <clears throat> so I get it when you die, your muscles tense up, but how come the gases will still be able to expand your stomach area? Oh, so people will become bloated. Yes. Well, there's just so the ability for your digestive tract to move, move those gases along or really any sort of fluid liquids that have been built up, um, your muscles have stopped working to move that along. So they'll just fill up kind of your stomach, your intestines, and that's kind of what gives the bloated appearance, I would assume. I'm not an expert. Yeah. On I mean, I was kind of guessing the same because I was thinking, you know, when you pass away, you, you, your feces and your urine comes out right away like that's definitely like your primary sign but like i'm saying like the gases should be able to come out you know come out from your anus or your your nose or something you know that's why the stench so that's why i was like hmm how is it even accumulating in the stomach yes so i have the information on that a little bit so oh, great. um can uh, you guys can you share that information i'm so sorry i have a crying yeah. baby i'll be right back but you're free free to talk take a couple minutes and i want to hear what you're going to say but i'll be right back guys okay so everybody is actually born with a little bit of candida yeast um in the that? stomach <clears throat> what does that mean i'm sorry what does that mean candida yeast it's a it's a, a live probiotic so our bot it's a live bacteria so our body has it um and we carry it all throughout life and when we die, that's actually the organism that begins the process of um, decomposition. And that's why we have it. And we just have issues. If you have a candida yeast overgrowth, you can have issues like autoimmune issues and everything like that. But in the death process, those we die, but the probiotics and bacteria in our intestines and our stomach don't die um, until, but so they continue to digest our food and affect our body and building up those gases. But since we've died, our intestines aren't contracting to release that in the form of bile, um, feces, or, or urine. So our body is keeping all of those things inside and that's why we get that buildup. Get to know. That's pretty cool. Hey, would would that apply the same thing, the same idea for your nails and your hair, right? It's just pretty much the same thing. Yeah, sorry I was on mute guys. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Um I got the last part of it. Sorry about this for the interruption. What's your background again, Ryan? Um, what do you, I can't remember where you work or. <laughs> I'm a hundred percent stay at home mom. Um, okay. But I have, um, I, I kind of sell products for Plexus. Okay. Which is um, all about gut health, which is where I learned about the candida yeast and, and all awesome. of that. Okay. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. It allowed, it allowed me to pick up a crying baby. So, um, <laughs> okay, I will continue on. Um, and uh, I'm just going to stop my video. Sorry about that because I realize I'm putting this on the internet and I don't like putting pictures of my kids online a lot. Um, anyway, so how are we feeling so far about, why don't you just put in the chat one to 10 how lost you are? Um, not lost, but um, if 10, you're feeling okay about it or you completely understand it. And one, this is completely new. I've never heard it before. Um, maybe even put one if you haven't ever heard this before, because that would help me know, because I don't know if you guys have had this before, but um, you don't have to be worried about 
um, offending me, or I mean, not offending me, but if you want to send me a private message, I just like to see how everyone's doing. Okay. Thank you guys for that. So, um, so we'll move on to muscle twitches. Um, and a muscle twitch refers to a single contraction of a muscle fiber in response to a stimulus. So this is something that we could replicate in lab. And I don't know if in lab, are we doing this or just learning the muscles, but it's something fun to see um, in lab of how we can stimulate a muscle fiber and then um, just basically see how it responds. But a muscle twitch has three phases. We, there's a latent phase, a contraction phase, and a relaxation phase. Uh, the latent phase refers to the time between the application of a stimulus and the beginning of a contraction. The contraction phase is the time during which the muscle contracts, and the relax, relaxation phase is the time during which the muscle relaxes. So we can um, take this, put this on a graph so we can, mus we can measure the tension of that muscle. Um, so the tension will increase when we stimulate that muscle fiber. Here's the lag at right after a stimulus has been applied, but here's the contraction phase and then the relaxation phase. So this is just one muscle twitch. Um, we do this when we talk about summation and recruitment to kind of explain what summation is and recruitment is. Uh, in summation, individual muscles will contract more forcefully, and this is what happens in your body. Your muscles will summate or use more muscle fibers to contract um, and recruit more to perform a larger, a larger load, I guess you could say. Uh, tetanus it will be a sustained contraction that occurs when the frequency of stimulation is so rapid that no relaxation occurs. So um, you'll, you never want your muscles to go into tetany, which, is, which means sustained muscle contraction. Recruitment is the stimulation of several motor units. So your muscles will recruit more motor units if they're trying to lift or move a heavier load. So we can put this on the graph um, showing um, a twitch, and this, this is a frequency of um, just the, the muscles, the stimulus being applied to that muscle. And we can get an incomplete tetanus shows that there's lag time in between um, the stimuli being applied and basically a lag between the twitches as well. And eventually we can get to complete tetanus where there's no lag time between twitch, twitches. And that just means that the muscle is continually contracting. So that's complete tetanus or complete tetany. There are different toxins and drugs that put your muscles into complete tetany. Um, obviously you don't wanna use those at all, um, but there are certain toxins and drugs that would perform a complete tetany on a muscle. So now we'll talk about slow twitch fibers and fast twitch fibers. And uh, we'll bring up a Thanksgiving turkey or a chicken, and I'll ask you guys all if you like red or dark meat or white meat, and now you'll understand why they're that color. Uh, so a slow twitch fiber contracts slowly. It also fatigues slowly. It has a considerable amount of myoglobin or storage capacity. It uses aerobic respiration, meaning oxygen is involved and it will be darker in color. So um, when we talk about slow twitch fibers, long distance runners will have a greater proportion of slow twitch fibers in their leg muscles um, because they're able to um, contract for longer amounts of time. Um, you'll have a lot of slow twitch fibers in the muscles of your back because they're constantly contracting to help to maintain posture. Um, so slow twitch fibers are dark in color. So which part of the bird has the dark meat? The thighs. The thighs, the legs, the drumstick, the thighs. Um, it's usually the part that more people like to eat because it has a higher fat content, the myoglobin content. Um, so, and that's the part of the bird that's usually doing a lot of the work. Um, either you know for the legs thighs move, moving around the fast twitch fibers are lighter in color so this would be the white meat of the bird um, and of you guys but it's kind of fun to think about what you're eating now 
and you can impress all your friends at Thanksgiving and family. Uh, but the fast twitch fibers contract quickly. They also fatigue quickly. They use anaerobic respiration, meaning there's not oxygen involved. Um, they get their energy to contract from glycogen storage. What glycogen is just the storage form of glucose. And there will be more fast twitch fibers in a person who might be a sprinter or um, a weightlifter who has to do kind of a quick rep um, because these will be fast twitching. Um, they'll contract quickly, but they'll also fatigue quickly and they are lighter in color. So all of your muscles throughout your body have both slow twitch and fast twitch fibers in them. But de depending on what you are accustomed to or what you've kind of built your body up doing, um, I probably have a lot of slow twitch muscle fibers in my back because I'm constantly like walking, standing, holding a screaming child. Um, some of you might have more fast twitch fibers if you like to run um, or sprint. Um, so humans have both types of fibers. Uh, there's a blend of each, um, but there usually will be one that dominates and the distribution of fibers will be, can also be genetically determined. Uh, I think you can build it up depending on your exercise level. Um, but it is also related to genetics. Okay, so muscle fibers are very energy demanding cells. Uh, so you'll see a lot of mitochondria, which create ATP in your muscle fiber cells. Uh, this energy will come from either aerobic with oxygen or anaerobic without oxygen, ATP production. So you'll ne need energy for muscle contraction and specifically, uh, involving that myosin binding to the actin. So how do we get all this ATP production? Um, it's derived from four processes in skeletal muscle. So the energy for muscle contraction, um, aerobic production of ATP during most exercise in normal conditions. So ATP is normally produced um, during aerobic production, which is, uses oxygen. And anaerobic production of ATP occurs during intensive short-term work. Um, there's the conversion of a molecule called creatine phosphate to ATP and the conversion of two ADP to one ATP and one AMP, which is adenosine monophosphate during heavy exercise. So this, these are just four steps um, or four options for energy for the muscle contraction. Muscle fatigue then, is a temporary state of reduced work capacity. Without fatigue, muscle fibers would be worked to the point of structural damage to them and their supportive tissues. Um, so all of your muscles will eventually um, fatigue uh, just to show their reduced work capacity because if your muscles don't go into a fatigue option, they will eventually damage themselves. So another reason why you should all probably use your bodies. Hi, Ray. So in Long the military, we used, we used to do a lot of muscle failure stuff, like literally muscle failure stuff. So, so failure? Yeah. So like, imagine, okay, so let's say, for example, a uh, simple exercise as push-ups, right? So we would do as many as you couldn't even lift yourself one time. So sounds like that was a negative thing. <laughs> I mean, it does help, but it's, it's horrible. Well, I mean, I, so you were probably trying, trying to like build up muscle, I'm assuming. Well, yes. So we were trying to build that, that uh, I wouldn't say intensity, but that, that ability to be able to do as many as we could, you know, without failing, you know. Yeah. So eventually, so eventually you got probably the muscle burn. Um, and that's, yes. It, that's, and fatigue. And then yeah. uh, some people cramped up too. Um, yeah. yeah. So the, the cramping, the muscle burn, that's, uh, that's the buildup build up of lactic acid that forms when your muscles run out of oxygen to contract. So um, when you start to feel that burn, that's what everyone likes to feel the burn. And that shows you're really working your muscles hard, but probably also you're probably at the point when you want to start resting them because your muscles are kind of running off without oxygen. So they build up lactic acid as a result. Um, which can eventually, it can raise your pH levels. Um, but it's not bad to get to that point, but you don't wanna, that's why eventually you can't go on anymore. Yeah, that's probably why I feel like a 60 year old right now. Yeah, oh man. 
you military guys sacrifice so much and women sacrifice a lot. Um, okay. Does that, I don't even know if that was a question or an answer. Yeah, yeah, that was a question. That was, okay. that was a pretty good answer, though. Okay. Yeah, and I think, I wonder if we'll talk about more about the buildup of lactic acid and feeling the burn. Um, the mechanism of fatigue, I guess we kind of start to talk about this, acidosis and ATP depletion. And acidosis means that lactic acid has build up, built up in your muscles your ATP had been depleted due to an either an increased ATP consumption or decreased ATP production. Oxidative stress, that's characterized by the buildup of excess reactive oxygen species. We call them ROSs, though that's free radicals. It's not good to have that oxidative stress and free radicals built up. Um, local inflammatory reactions can also be a result um, or attribute to muscle fatigue. And I guess that's all we kind of talk about with that. But the acidosis and ATP depletion is due to uh, lactic acid building up because um, you've run out of ATP, basically. And you can feel that. You physically feel that when you perform too many reps or if you run 20 miles. Um, my husband loves to run, and I ran a marathon. And uh, they, I think that's too far to push your body 26 miles. The people who can still do that are like, they're just a different type of human, I think. They're kind of superhuman because running that much and putting your muscles through that much really does a lot of damage uh, to many parts of your body, but kudos to them. Their hearts are probably three times the size as ours. Um, the, rest in, the rest in heart rate is probably like 30, maybe even more. Yeah, they're superhuman. Yeah, and their hearts, I think they're genetically built to do that because it's just, yeah, it's crazy. Um, okay, so types of contractions, there's two, and this is a longer PowerPoint, but towards the end of this PowerPoint, it goes over all the types of muscles, and we're probably going to just cut off that part because uh, we're going to be doing that in lab. Um, there's two types of muscle contractions, isometric and isotonic. The isometric contraction has an increase in muscle tension, but no change in length. And an isotonic contraction has a change in muscle length with no change in tension. And I wanna show, oh, they don't give me a picture of this. Um, so an isometric contraction, an example of this would be if you're pushing with all your force against a wall, but you don't move the wall. So um, you're increasing the muscle tension, but your muscle isn't actually changing length. You're not moving anything. The isotonic contraction has a change in muscle length. So that would be lifting up a water bottle or lifting a five pound weight. Um, that would, that would um, change your muscle length with no change in the tension. So you're, you're able to lift something. Uh, concentric contractions are isotonic contractions in which the mus muscle tension increases as the muscle shortens. And eccentric contractions are isotonic contractions in which the tension is maintained in a muscle but the opposing resistance causes the muscle to lengthen. Okay, muscle tone is the constant tension produced by body muscles over long periods of time. So there's many muscles in your body that um, have this muscle tone, it's constant tension being produced. Um, this is responsible for keeping your back and legs straight, the head in an upright position, and the abdomen from bulging. So this constant um, tone keeps everything where it should be. Um, again, I'm always thinking about in terms of babies because I have a newborn, but um, this is why you need to do tummy time for your, your babies so that they can hold their heads up uh, because their muscles in the back of their necks can't hold their heads up yet. So um, now we're able to hold our heads up because of muscle tone. Um, the muscle tone depends on a small percentage of all the motor units in the muscle being stimulated at any point in time causing their muscle fibers to contract uh, tetany, tetanically, so being constantly stimulated and out of phase with one another. So this talks about tetany being constantly stimulated, but it's not stimulating all of them at the same time. Different ones are being fired. Uh, smooth muscle cells. So now we're going to get into the different other types of muscles, smooth muscle and cardiac. Smooth muscle cells are non-striated. They're small spindle-shaped muscle cells, usually with one nucleus per cell. 
Uh, the myofilaments are not organized into sarcomeres, so you don't see striations. Um, the cells comprise all internal organs that are controlled involuntarily, except your heart, because that's something that's separated. Um, and neurotransmitter substances, hormones, and other substances can stimulate smooth muscle cells. Then cardiac muscle cells has to do with your heart. Um, they're long striated branching. There's usually one nucleus per cell. Um, cardiac muscle is striated as a result of the sarcomere arrangement. And the cardiac muscle contraction is autorhythmic, meaning um, your heart cells can stimulate or just begin their own heartbeats. And if we were to remove your heart from the body, the heart would continue beating on its own by itself. Um, not forever, because it eventually needs oxygen from blood, which would be given to it from other blood vessels, but the heart will continue to beat on its own um, if removed from your body for, no, I'm not sure how long, but it will continue beating. Uh, cardiac muscle cells are, will be connected to one another by specialized structures that include desmosomes and gap junctions, and these are called intercalated discs and cardiac muscle cells function as a single unit in that action potential in one cardiac muscle cell can stimulate action potentials in adjacent, in adjacent cells. And this helps to give your cardiac muscle cells their ability to establish and maintain their own heartbeats. Okay, then these are the skeletal muscles shown in the body. Um, and I'm just going to stop the share for one second and check on one thing, just to double check um, what we're doing in lab, because I believe in lab today, we're gonna be going over all of these, and I don't wanna give you guys too much information if we're all kind of brain fried already. Okay, any questions while I'm just taking a quick pause break here, or comments? Okay. So yeah, lab today, we're gonna be going over all the muscles. I just wanna make sure we're gonna do them. And I'm gonna then pause the PowerPoint here. Um, you guys can work through this PowerPoint on your own. Um, we'll kind of talk about the skeletal muscle anatomy and then we'll, then we'll end because then it goes through all the muscles. So your skeletal muscle anatomy, um, a tendon connects skeletal muscle to bone. An aponeurosis is a broad sheet-like tendon. A retinaculum is a band of connective tissue that holds tendons down together in your wrist and your ankle. And each muscle has what we call an origin and an assertion. An origin is the attachment um, that's least movable or mobile. And the insertion is the end of the muscle with the greatest movement. Um, the part of the muscle between the origin and insertion is called the belly. And then a group of muscles working together are called agonists and a group of muscles that oppose action are called antagonists. So this is a look at where an insertion point would be at the distal end of the muscle, and the origin would be at the proximal end, the least movable part. Here's your biceps brachii versus the triceps brachii. They're antagonist muscles because they have opposing actions. Your biceps will flex your forearm, and your triceps will extend or stretch your arm out. So that is a little bit of anatomy of the muscles themselves. Um, nomenclature, muscles are named according to their location, their size, their shape, the orientation of their fascicles, um, which are kind of the, again, the bundles of nerve fibers. They, are, they can run straight or at an angle. So muscles will have a rectus or oblique name to them. Uh, we'll go through the muscles of mastication, which are chewing, and then we'll get through the thoracic muscles, which elevate the rib cage. The abdominal muscles are on the sides and front of your stomach wall. Um, and I think from here, I'm going to pause it because we will go over these all in lab. You will be responsible for these in, for lecture exam too, um, but I think I'm going to pause it here so we don't become too redundant. 